In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Welcome again to our Sunday afternoon virtual lesson. So glad that you are allowing me to join you where you are as we spend time studying God's Word. It may be that you're watching with family or friends gathered at your house or maybe one of their houses. Maybe you're at work and you're taking this time on your break to spend time in God's Word. Appreciate you joining us and allowing us to be there with you. Go ahead and open to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and let's begin reading at verse 1. We're going to read through verse 10, and then I'll tell you a little background and we'll go into what's going on here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Now we ask you, brothers, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to meet him, that you not be quickly shaken in your mind or alarmed, whether by a spirit or a word or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it has not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes a seat in the sanctuary of God, exhibiting himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that his time, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness, lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will slay with the breath of his mouth and will bring to an end by the appearance of his coming, whose coming is in accord with the working of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and all the deception of unrighteousness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of truth, so as to be saved. And we'll stop there for, for today's lesson. It seems that the Thessalonians still had some misunderstandings about Christ coming, about his return. You might recall in First Thessalonians they were concerned that it was possible that those people who had died before Christ's return would miss out. So Paul deals with that and says, no, those of us who are alive are not going to prevent that. It seems at this point now, some other people have been saying, well, Christ did come and you just missed it. He's already come and, and, and you haven't seen it yet. And so Paul says, no, no, that's not the case. You didn't miss it. Christ hasn't come. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, then Paul lays out some things that must happen before Christ returns. Now, let me say that I do not claim to be any type of expert on everything that there is involved in the second coming of Christ. What I do know is what I read in Scripture, and I'm going to stick today with what Paul says here and try to understand it just from what he says here, not going into Revelation or what John says or what Paul says in other places, but what he's saying in this section of Scripture right here. What he says in this context is the first thing that's going to happen is there will be an apostasy. An apostasy just simply means a falling away, that people will leave the way of Christ. That's what Paul is saying, that there will be those who will turn their back on God. Throughout history, there seems to have been many times when this has occurred, where Christianity, where the church was going in the right direction, and then something happens and, and people leave God. If you look at many Western cultures today, those cultures that are, are historically predominantly Christian, including the United States, you can see that, that there are things going on that would make you think, well, maybe this is the apostasy because so many in the United States are leaving faith. In fact, one recent poll shows the fastest growing group of religious people are those that consider themselves non, not religious, not affiliated with anything. And so there is, in a sense, in the Western world and in the United States, a, a an apostasy. But yet, there seem to be parts of the world that are turning to Christ. Places like India, different nations within the African continent. In Ukraine, during the war, I'm seeing over many, many posts about people who are turning to Christ as they are running from their homes and trying to flee the the oppression that's going on. 
So there's not an apostasy there. So if Paul is talking about a worldwide apostasy, then what we're seeing now really isn't what he's talking about. So what is he talking about? And maybe we don't really know. Maybe we could make some guesses, but we don't know for certain. But it says after this apostasy, the man of lawlessness be, will be revealed. Who is this man of lawlessness? Well, he's also known as the son of perdition or the son of destruction. But what is that? Who is that? Unlike the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness seems to be a person. Now, I know sometimes people try to associate Antichrist with the man of lawlessness, but I think they are two different concepts and, and one's an individual and one is an idea. In fact, when John writes about Antichrist, and John is the one who writes about Antichrist in First John and mostly in First John and in Second John, none in Revelation, just in First and Second John. When he writes about the Antichrist, he says the Antichrists are already here. In other words, those who oppose Christ, those who claim that Christ is not the Son of God are anti-Christ, they're Antichrist. And so for 2,000 years, give or take, there has been Antichrist, there have been Antichrists in the world. From the time John wrote until now, there were those who deny that Jesus is the Son of God. But the man of lawlessness seems to be different. Paul seems to identify him as, as an individual that is being held back, restrained, and then one day those restraints will be loosed and, and he will come, he will be revealed. In fact, his revelation seems to be something that's going to be obvious because the word revealed is the same word that is used to describe Jesus' return when he is revealed with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel. So there seems to be this man of lawlessness. When he arrives, it's going to be obvious. Through the years, many people have tried to name him and they've assigned different characters or maybe different different roles as, as that person. And I'm not sure that we are able to do that because those things have not been obvious to the world. Those things have not been obvious to Christianity. And, and some of those characters or individuals or groups have been around or were around a thousand years ago, and yet the end hasn't come. So there's something else. There's someone else. What I do know about him is what's in the text. And what's in the text is that he will oppose everything that is godly. No holds barred. He is going to oppose what is right and what is good. And he's going to do all the things that are wrong and all the things that are evil in so many ways. But he's going to set himself up as greater than and equal to and greater than God. Put himself in God's place in the world. That is going to be who he, who he is and what he does when he is no longer restrained as he currently is. And this the spirit of this lawlessness, Paul says, is already at work. That It's already building up to the fact that this person could be ex expected and, and, and could exist. So even when Paul is writing this, he's saying there are people who are, who are lawless. There are people who have this same direction, but they're not him. And even today, we can look and maybe we can identify people who, who are opposed to God and, and seem lawless. And maybe they are lawless. They have this spirit of lawlessness. But are they that person? Unless it's obvious, we really don't know. People are already headed away from godliness. But there's good news in all of this. The good news is when that man of lawlessness is revealed, whomever he is, and whenever he is revealed, he is defeated. And that's what Paul says. That when he is revealed, Jesus is going to crush him. Jesus is going to destroy him, will be victorious over him. And not only him, but all those who don't love truth and don't love what is right. That this is an immediacy. So when the man of lawlessness appears... He's not going to have time to do anything because Christ is going to come back and defeat him. So much in there that I honestly don't understand. And I would tell you that people who claim to know everything there is, well, they don't really know because Paul is quite cryptic. And we can make some guesses. 
but we don't know all the facts that involve here. But here's what we can learn. And I think this is what Paul is trying to get the Thessalonians to see and for us to see what we're to make of this. The first thing is we do not know. We do not know when this will occur. And I'm not so sure that's important. It's not important for us to know when. What is important is not that anyone knows who or does not know who this person is or when this will occur. What's important is that he does return, that Christ does return, that these events will happen. And when it does, Christ wins. And because Christ wins, then don't we want to be on his side? Don't we want to walk with God in Christ? And because these things will happen, and though we don't know when, and we don't have any hint as to when, what we do know is we need to be ready for when they do. It's a song that we sometimes sing, and we've sung it my entire life in church. The song asks this question, there's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. Will you be ready for that great day? That's the question. And I think that's what Paul is trying to get the Thessalonians to see. It's not about if, it's about when and who. But we don't need to know the when and we don't really need to know the who. What we need to know is that we are ready and we are with Christ. Maybe that's why in the middle of this book, Paul writes these words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3. But the Lord is faithful. That's probably enough right there. But the Lord is faithful, who will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. Isn't that wonderful to know? That no matter what happens around you, no matter if the end comes tomorrow, today, that the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen and guard you from the evil one. Are you on the side of God, the side of right, the side of eternity. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for the blessings you give us. And Father, sometimes we get concerned over when the end will come. But Father, we don't need to know when, we just need to know it will. And that when it does, that we are ready and that we are with you. Father, I pray that we are ready. I pray that those who hear my voice or watch this video will make sure that they are ready for when you return, that they will, that they do know you and that they will obey that good news if they haven't already. Father, for those that are your children, Father, may we be found faithful. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It may be that you want to talk more about being ready, about making sure that when Christ comes, whenever that might be, that you will be ready to go home with him and live with him for eternity you're not sure about that, if you want to make sure, then please reach out to me. Thank you again for joining me. I do look forward to these and I hope you do as well. Know that God loves you and we do too. Until the next time we're together, my prayer is, as always, that God will bless your day. Here in the power of Christ.